Hey everyone, let's pick up where we left off. And, and in fact, let me write down what we did last time. So that was uh, lemma um, 15.5, uh, was it 15.5, I think? Uh, yeah, 15.5. <clears throat> if, uh, so what do we have? Uh, let's let G have finite order and uh, N a normal subgroup. And so then if, um, if the quotient G mod N has an element of uh, order K, <clears throat> then so does G, right? So if the quotient has an element of order K, then so does the, the, the numerator group, the big group. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to need this fact for our next theorem. And so this is theorem 15.6. And <clears throat> this is, uh, well, it's a special case of what's known as Cauchy's theorem. So let's give this a label, Cauchy's theorem. Special case. And so um, it goes like this. So let's let G be a finite abelian group. Um, and, and, and I also need a prime number. So let's say and let P be prime. And so then it goes like this. If <clears throat> this prime number P divides the order of the group G, then G has an element of order P. <clears throat> now, we know that this is not true in general. And when I say in general, <clears throat> meaning just because a number divides the order of the group does not mean that you have an element of that of that same uh, same order, right? But in the case that you have a prime divisor, then you are guaranteed to have an element of that order. So the key here is having the prime number p. The fact that p is prime is what makes this work. Um, <clears throat> so, and this proof. This, is, uh, this proof is fun, and it's going to haul out a technique that you probably have never seen before. And so um, the proof, and, and, and when I say you've never seen this before, I mean, you've seen induction. The proof is by induction, but in this case, what we're going to be inducting on is the order of the group G. This is something that we've never done before and more than likely you have not done in the past, induct on the order of a set or the cardinality of the set. So this proof is induction on order of G. <clears throat> um, <coughs> right, so, so first let's get the easy case out of the way. So if, um, uh, 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 if the order of G equals 2, then, well, okay, so then G has a trivial element and a non-trivial element, and the non-trivial element, right, has order 2. So then the uh, non-trivial element of G has Order two, right? And that's the only prime that divides the number two, so so that takes care of that. Right, so now, right, there's our base case. So now let's assume that we, we need to set up our inductive hypothesis correctly here. So I want to say this carefully. So assume that the result holds for all abelian groups of order 
uh, strictly less than the order of G, right? So there's our inductive hypothesis. And, and, and what do I mean by this? So, so let's say that is if H is abelian and the order of H is strictly less than the order of G, <clears throat> then, um, oh, and P is a prime that divides the order of H, then H has an element of order P, right? So that sets up our inductive hypothesis. <clears throat> or I guess I should say sets up. That is the statement of our inductive hypothesis. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's just choose an element. So um, let's choose an element, a non-trivial element. So I want to choose x in g minus e. And then we'll say and right. So, so x is going to have some order. It's not equal to the identity. So x is going to have, have order 2 or greater. So let's write um, the order of x equal to m. And we know that this number m is going to be greater than or equal to 2. Now, m is just some, some positive integer, which means that it has prime divisors. I want to just, just pick any prime divisor. So pick any prime divisor, call it q of m. <clears throat> And so what does that mean, right? So that um, M is equal to Q times K. <clears throat> okay. So then, then what? Um, right, so then X to the k raised to the q, that's equal to x to the m, which is equal to e. And so, um, and so what? The order of x, oh, sorry, order of x to the k, is equal to q. Uh, okay, you might say, uh, are you sure about that? Okay, so let's see what just happened here. We know that x to the k raised to the qth power gives us the identity. So what that would typically tell us then is that the order of x to the k is less than or equal to q. But we have this added fact that m is the order of x. And so if there was a number smaller than q, so that x to the k raised to that number gave us the identity, it would contradict the minimality of m. So this is true by minimality of m, right? We know that x to the k is equal to q. Now, <clears throat> we could have gotten lucky if, um, if Q equals P, we are done. All right, we found an element of G that has order P. Yeah, but maybe we didn't get lucky. So otherwise, meaning if Q is not equal to P, so otherwise, um, so I want to consider Otherwise, consider 
the group H, oops, H, equal to G mod, the subgroup generated by um, uh, X to the K. This is where the abelian part comes into play. Because G is abelian, I can take this quotient and I know that I have a group. If G was not abelian, the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K, uh, X to the K may or may not be normal, and so we may or may not be able to take this quotient. Right? So that's where we need the abelian part. <clears throat> now, since the order of H, okay, so what's the order of H going to be? It's going to equal the order of G divided by uh, the order of this group right here, and we know that this group is equal to Q. Let's see now. Um, P is a prime divisor of the order of G. And so if I look at the order of H, I compute this number right here, or I, I, I compute this fraction right here, and guess what? When you look at this fraction right here, right, we divide it out by Q, which means that in the prime factorization of the order of H, P is still sitting in there. P is a divisor of the order of H. So we have <clears throat> that P divides the order of H. And so um, also, I guess here's another place that we need the fact that G is abelian. So since we need it twice. So since um, uh, uh, H is abelian, um, Say that, uh, and that's because quotients of abelian groups are, are are abelian. So let's put the reason here. That's theorem. I think it's fourteen point one, or uh, sorry, fifteen point one. Yeah, fifteen point one. By the inductive hypothesis um, H has an element of order p. So uh, uh, by the inductive hypothesis, H has an element of order P. Ah, okay, now, remember, H is a quotient of G, and in our previous lemma, we showed that if the quotient has an element of order P, then so does the big group. All right, so by our previous lemma, which is lemma... 15.5 uh, G has an element of order P. This is a fun proof, right? So by induction, the result holds for all groups G. Right, so by induction, uh, the result holds for all abelian groups, finite abelian groups. That's a great proof. I really like that. And here's the idea. Here's what happened, right? Um, Here's what happened. We wanted to do induction. How do you work induction? Well, you need to drop down a level. You need to have a group of smaller order. So what did we do? We created this quotient whose order was strictly less than G. And then we were able to apply the, induct the inductive hypothesis and get an element of order P sitting inside H. And then our previous lemma gave us the element sitting inside G. So this is a fun proof. I like this one. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Oh, yeah, got lots of time. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> that's the end of the proof. It turns out 
right? This was a special case of Cauchy's theorem. It turns out that it's actually true for all groups, not just abelian groups. So um, it turns out that this result is true for all finite groups. If you have a prime divisor of, a of the order of a finite group, then you're guaranteed that that finite group has an element of order p, that, whatever that prime number is. Um, so it's true for all finite groups. Uh, but the proof in the general case, and that's what's known as Cauchy's theorem, right? If p divides the order of g, then uh, g has an element of order p. Uh, the techniques that are required for that proof are more advanced than we have. We just don't have the technology for this. Um, so uh, it's true for all finite groups, right? But the proof of the general Cauchy theorem, so the proof of the general case, the non-abelian case, requires more advanced techniques. Now, <clears throat> kind of talk about quotient groups a bit now. What's going on when we do this quotient process? Um, so, so that's sort of the end of, of the discussion of Cauchy's theorem. And now just more of a, a, a general discussion. So um, when n is a normal subgroup of g, the quotient g mod n is what I'll call a, and I'll put this in quotes, a coarse approximation of the group G. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when you take a quotient, it's possible. I mean, you make a smaller group, so you could destroy some information, right? So the quotient process destroys some information. So some information about G, but it may preserve some and you have this added benefit of having a smaller group. It may be easier to understand in some sense. So it destroys uh, some information about G but the smaller group G mod N may reveal some of the structure of G. So, um, yeah, so what are we saying here? What, what's the point? So it's kind of a two-way street, right? Uh, when you start off with a group G and you find a normal subgroup, you create this group G mod N, and this, just, this group G mod N may be interesting to study on its own right. So by starting off with G, you create this new group G mod N that might be worthwhile to study. So it's a new group. And so then you might say, okay, since we know some stuff about G, what does that tell us about G mod N? It also goes in the reverse direction. The smaller group G mod N may tell us something about G. So you go back and forth, sometimes using G to get information about G mod N and then vice versa, knowing something about G mod N can tell you something about G. <clears throat> oh, I'm getting thirsty. So, if you have 
a non-trivial group. Let's say like this. Um, so note that every non-trivial group G has at least two normal subgroups. Guaranteed. As long as you're not looking at the identity group, right? Any non-trivial group has at least two normal subgroups. And who are they? Well, there's the trivial subgroup, and then there's G itself, right? So those two subgroups are guaranteed to be normal subgroups, and then the group may have more. <clears throat> so now that leads us to a definition, and this definition is going to be one, it's going to be a word that, that um, triggers, <laughs> or uh, well, let's just write down the definition. Um, so a group a non-trivial group um, G is simple if this is it, if it's only got those two um, uh, 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 normal subgroups. So group G is simple if it has no non-trivial proper normal subgroups, right? So we're defining this term simple, right? Simple groups are those that are non-trivial themselves, and the only normal subgroups that it has are the trivial subgroup and the whole subgroup. So it's got no non-trivial proper subgroup, normal subgroups. <clears throat> so for example, So, uh, first example, um, if P is prime, then ZP is simple. Um, why is that true? <clears throat> it's basically a consequence of Lagrange's theorem, right? If you take any... Um, take any non-zero element of ZP, then it's a generator of ZP. So the cyclic subgroup generated by any non-zero element is equal to all of ZP. That means that the only subgroups of ZP are the identity, the zero subgroup in that case, and all of ZP. Right? <clears throat> uh, another example, and let's state this, I'm going to state this as a theorem, although we're not going to prove this. Um, theorem 15.7. Uh, This theorem is useful when it comes to Galois theory, but for our purposes, it's just a it's just an interesting fact. I'll, I'll I'll explain why this is useful later on. So if n is greater than or equal to five, then the alternating group a sub five is simple. You might notice something about the number five right there. Um, and, and and another thing to note. So let's say also note. that A3, so let's see, A3 has order um, <clears throat> 3 factorial over 2, which is 3. So, so this is a subgroup of order 3, which means that it's isomorphic to Z3. And so A3 is simple. So the only one that remains here in terms of the alternating groups is A4, and A4 actually does have a normal subgroup. So um, for uh, n equals 4, the subgroup, and I think I've written this one out before, so the subgroup, uh, uh, let's call it n, and it consists of the identity, and then it's got uh, 1, 2 times 3, 4. 
one, two times three, four, and one, three times uh, two, four, and um, one, four times two, three is normal in a sub four, right? So there's an example of a non-trivial um, proper subgroup of A4, right? So A4 is not simple. So A4 is not simple. <clears throat> now, here's the consequence. So why, why, why am I mentioning this stuff and why am I saying this is a theorem? This is important. So let me just kind of sketch the idea. And like I said, you might notice that this 5 comes into play, or somehow this 5 is important right here. And then I said the word Galois group. So if you know anything about Galois theory, one of the things that it does for you is it gives this idea of the, or, or it allows you, allowed you know, um, Galois, to prove the insolvability of the quintic. So... Let me, let me just write this out. <clears throat> so a consequence. Um, so a consequence of this theorem. Uh, there exist polynomials. Um... <clears throat> of degree greater than or equal to 5 that are, and, and the, the, the proper term is that they are not <clears throat> solvable by radicals. And what that means is that <clears throat> there's no formula involving just uh, the standard field operations of addition, multiplication, division, subtraction, and taking roots that will give us the roots of the polynomial. In other words, you can't factor it. Right? There's no nice formula for factoring it. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and here's the idea. Right? If you go on to math 483, um, we'll actually, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll flesh out the details on this and we'll see why that's true, why there is no nice formula for factoring polynomials of degree, um, of degree 5 or greater. Um, so here's the idea. <clears throat> um, to each polynomial P of X, there's a corresponding, what's called a Galois group. So to each polynomial, there is... And associated, and this is called a Galois group, so right, we'll learn what that is later on. So to each polynomial, there's a corresponding group. Um, let's let's give it a symbol. <clears throat> Gamma of P of X. Um, now, <clears throat> all right, so every time you got a polynomial, you, you can create this corresponding group. And then for each n greater than or equal to 5, there is a, a polynomial. P of X, um, where its Galois group, <clears throat> right, is isomorphic to the symmetric group S of N. So where um, the Galois group is isomorphic to S of N. And then <clears throat> the alternating group A sub N lives inside S of N. Right? So because... Uh, a sub n 
is a subgroup of S of n. By our previous theorem, which we, where we know that it's not simple, A sub n is not simple for n greater than or equal to 5. Um, <clears throat> so the structure of the Galois group for this particular polynomial is such um, that <clears throat> such that uh, finding roots by radicals is impossible. Right, so it's the fact that for n greater than or equal to 5, a sub n is simple. It provides this, it, it creates this obstruction to being able to find roots by, by radicals. Right? So, so there's a little bit of, uh, yeah, it just makes it algebraically impossible. And it's, it's, it's this fact that, that, that it's the simplicity that does it to us. So, yeah, I think, I think we'll stop there and we'll, we'll talk more about simple groups and their, um, their rule in, in algebra um, next time. Okay, see ya.